You know, I think most of the time, the 12 disciples get a bad rap. I don't know about you, but I, I often think about uh, the, the 12 disciples as this bumbling band of dimwits that are constantly frustrating Jesus because they're missing the nuanced uh, the nuances of his teaching, or maybe they're just, they're just missing the point altogether. But I think, at least today, we need to cut the disciples some slack, okay? Can we just be honest with each other for a second? Maybe this just stays, stays within this room, but let's just be honest. Jesus is not the easiest guy to understand most days. Is that fair to say? I mean, Jesus is a rabbi, he's a Jewish teacher, and as a rabbi, he stands in a long line of Jewish teachers all throughout history. And, and the rabbis taught some pretty complicated stuff. They said some pretty encrypted stuff. Most of that came through what was called a parable. And a parable was an ancient tool used uh, by rabbis to teach uh, their disciples. And the way a parable would work is you would have this deeply profound, mysterious teaching, something right on the edge of our ability to understand it. And, and rather than trying to explain what that is, the, the, the rabbi would use a parable, which is basically just a folk story, with this very simple, mundane, everyday life type of, type of situations. And by looking at those simple situations, they would begin to say, well, this is what this is what this deeply mysterious thing is like. It would be like if somebody came up to you and asked, what is love? Well, you would probably stumble around for a few minutes saying, well, it's like a chemical reaction, and this hormone does this, and this hormone does this, and that's why you get a warm fuzzy. And... But eventually, the best way that you can explain what love is is what? To tell a story about a time you saw love in action. Or to tell a story about a time that you experienced true love. Love is, love is a deep mystery. It's a profound mystery that defies just a simple mechanical explanation. And the kingdom of God is the same way. The kingdom of God, which is the content of an overwhelming, overwhelming majority of Jesus' teaching, the kingdom of God is right out there on the edge of our understanding. It's a it's a profound mystery. And so in order to describe and explain what the kingdom of God is, Jesus chooses to use parables, these, these stories of something that's everyday, mundane, seemingly simple. But by using those, he's giving a window into the reality of what the kingdom of God is like. So Jesus sees a crowd gather. He had just gone from town to town, and this crowd begins to follow him. And he sees this crowd gather, and he says to them in a parable, a sower went out to sow a seed. Some of that seed fell on the walking path, and it was trampled on and eaten by the birds. Some of it fell on rock, and yeah, it may have, it may have grown just a little bit, but it withered away because of lack of moisture. It went out to the, to the thorns, but the thorns choked it out. But finally, it landed in the good soil. It landed in the good soil. And when it grew, it produced a crop a hundredfold. And then, and then Jesus would do like, he would do like um, the mic drop equivalent of rabbis. He said, let anyone who has ears to hear listen. Right? He'd walk away. And you can just imagine all these people that had, had followed Jesus from their towns, maybe walking miles and miles and miles to hear him teach, and then they, they sit there and look at each other and go, we just got a botany lesson. Like, we came and listened to this guy? Yeah, Jesus, we get it. Great story, dude. Like, nothing really happened. Pretty obvious stuff. Put a seed on some rock, doesn't grow. Put it in some dirt, it grows. We get it. But then you keep reading on in Luke chapter 8, and Jesus says, no, 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 you've got to look deeper. This is not just a simple parable about seeds and soil. This is a parable about how God will bring about his kingdom in the world. And he gives us a hint. He says that the seed is the word of God. See, Jesus had gone from town to town preaching, and the disciples, they're not fools. They noticed that as Jesus went from town to town preaching, that there were some people in the crowd that heard Jesus that followed him, and there were some that did not. 
people that heard Jesus did not follow him. Right? And you're sitting there thinking, how in the world is this the case that the Son, the Son of God himself preaching the Word of God, and yet people don't follow? How can that be? So Jesus tells this parable. He says, well, the seed is the Word of God, and the Word of God falls on four different types of soil. And that soil, four different types of human hearts. He says, there are those whose hearts are like the walking path. These are people who have been worn down so much by the trials and troubles of this life that they really can't even be considered soil anymore. There's something totally different. I mean, these people have been beat down and hardened by repeated heartbreak. They've heard the Word of God, but they, they're not in a place where they can truly receive it. The Word of God falls upon their hearts, but there's no way for it to, to get in there and to take root. We might call these the wayward hearts. The wayward hearts. Those hearts that, for whatever reason, have gone astray over time. There is no soil there. This, it's, just, it's just hardened ground. Do you know someone like that? Someone who's been trampled upon and picked over by the world? Someone who has become so accustomed to despair and grief that they just they can't hear a word of hope. Someone who's become so accustomed to hatred and violence that they, they just simply cannot hear a word of grace. Do you know someone like that? Then Jesus mentions the rocky ground. Now, it's important to note here that when he's saying the, rock, the rocky ground or the rock, what he, he's not talking about if you look at a, a, a patch of ground and you see the jagged rocks coming out of the dirt. No, he's talking about something a lot more subtle. And I think he's talking about something that's a lot more powerful for us today. He's not talking about the obvious rocks. When he says rocky ground, he's talking about the ground that by all appearances looks like good soil, but you dig an inch, inch or two deep and there's nothing but a layer of impenetrable rock. That's actually quite common in the Middle East, that you would look out and you would see dirt and it would look like a good patch of soil, but you just dig an inch or two below it and there's nothing but rock. And so what Jesus is actually referring to here is not rocky soil. What he's referring to here is shallow soil. Do you know people like this? Those people that keep up the appearance. They, they work really hard to say the right thing, to dress the right way, to, to, to live in the right place, to, to look a certain way, and yet under that facade of their appearance, there's nothing but a heart of stone. Do you know someone like that? Someone who may have received the Word of God at some time and, uh, and may have received it with joy, but then something, something tragic, something difficult happened in their life and their faith almost in an instant, withered because there was no depth there. Maybe it's someone who was baptized and confirmed. Maybe it's someone who went to vacation in Bible school or local mission project. Maybe it's someone that's gone on international mission trips or attended Bible studies their entire life. Maybe it was someone who was sitting in a pew for 60 years. And yet you scratch the surface just a little bit and there's nothing there. There's just rock and stone. The Word of God has never been able to take root. Do you know someone like that? Then there are the thorns. And Jesus gives a little glimmer of, of hope here. He says that the seeds that are thrown among the thorns, they actually grow. Well, that's a, that's a sign of good news, right? They actually grow a little bit. But then the problem is that the thorns grow with them, and the thorns choke out the seed so that the seed cannot grow anymore. And Jesus goes on to explain that the thorns are the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life. The thorns are the things that distract us from the life of faith. 
But these hearts are the distracted. Those who might want to follow God and might sincerely want to. And yet, the clutter of their life prevents them from being faithful to that call. Do you know someone like that? Someone who really does want to grow in their faith, but they keep getting distracted by worldly pursuits, pursuits of wealth or pleasure. Someone who says that they want to follow the Lord, but their bank account and their schedule says something different. Someone who, for whatever reason, cannot give up what they want so that they can hear what God wants them to be and what God wants them to do. Do you know someone like that? For, for one of these, or maybe for all of them, you might be thinking, yeah, yeah, I do know someone like that. And that someone is me. But Jesus, praise be to God, doesn't end his parable on a down note. No, Jesus says, no, there are, there are some hearts that we could consider a good soil. And he says, these are the, the, the hearts that hear the word of God and do what it says. And that's a very important distinct, distinction that Jesus is trying to make there. So he speaks a lot about hearing throughout the explanation of this parable, doesn't he? He speaks a lot about hearing. But the word he uses there, the word hear, is actually the word akuo. It's where we get our word acoustic. And akuo, in the original language, it doesn't just mean to hear something with your ears. It means to hear it, to understand it, and to live it out into your life. See, in the ancient uh, mindset, hearing is deeply tied to understanding. And understanding is deeply tied to doing. You didn't really hear it if you don't understand it. Makes sense, right? You didn't really hear it if you don't understand it. But you also didn't really understand it if it doesn't change how you live your life. There's a story of a man named uh, George Whitfield, a very vibrant Methodist, Methodist preacher back in the 18th century. He was a, he was a companion of Wesley, and they had a lot of correspondence back and forth. Uh, but but John, uh, George Whitfield was a master preacher. An incredible orator. He, he would draw literally thousands and thousands of people anywhere he went that just wanted to hear him speak. It, it was said that, that George could bring a throng of people to their knees weeping by simply uttering the word Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. I still got some work to do. After one particularly successful revival camp meeting that he spent a whole week preaching and hundreds and hundreds of people had come forward to receive Christ. He met a man when he was heading out of town and the man stopped and he said, George, I saw what an incredible response people had last week. It was incredible. You did fantastic. How many souls did you save, George? How many souls did you save? To which George replied, I don't know. Let's meet back here in six months and see. See, George knew the truth. And the truth is, you don't really hear the Word of God unless it makes a difference in your life. You could be sitting here for years and years and years, and yet, if every time you walk out of this room, every time you walk through those doors back into the world, you are exactly the same. Church, i got to ask the question, maybe you... Maybe you haven't received the gift of salvation. Maybe you haven't borne the fruits of salvation in your life. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not asking if you've been baptized. I'm not asking if you've been confirmed. I'm not asking you what your church attendance is. I'm asking, are you bearing the fruits of salvation in your life? Ha, has your anxiety been transformed into peace? Ha, has your grief been transformed into worship? Has your, has your anger been transformed into forgiveness? Because if, if not, it's, it's quite possible, church, that you're one of the wayward, or you're one of the shallow, or you're one of the distracted. 
But if you are one of these, I mean, can you do anything to change it? Is there anything that bad soil can do to become good soil? Are you just out of luck, or is there, is there a way to be transformed? Well, I think you ask any, any good farmer, and uh, the farmer will tell you that in order to prepare the ground to receive seed, you've got to till the soil, right? You've got to break up the ground so that it's ready to receive whatever seed you're about to give it. And I want to suggest to you that, uh, that here at First Church, I think we have a way to till the soil of your hearts so that you can be prepared to receive the Word of God in new and profound ways. You've heard Andrew and I both speak recently about what we believe to be the three pillars of any faithful congregation. That faithful congregations gather together for holy worship. That they grow together in small group discipleship through through studying the scriptures and through prayer, and that they go together to serve in the community and into the world. And it's this rhythm, really, this cycle, this repeated cycle of gathering, growing, and going, gr gathering, growing, and going, gathering, growing, and going that tills the soil of our hearts so that me we might receive the word of God, that we might not only hear it, but that we might actually start to do it. I want to call this the tiller of transformation. The tiller of transformation. I mean, this is how you prevent your heart from becoming hardened or shallow or distracted. You devote yourself to these three things regularly. You devote yourself to being in worship every single week. Friends, we know you travel. We know that you're out of town a lot. We know that you travel for business or for vacation. But if you're here, you need to be in worship. You need to gather with the saints for holy worship. You devote yourself to being a part of a small group. That might be a Sunday school class or one of our other small groups that meets throughout the week. It, it might be a covenant group that meets on Wednesday night during covenant connection. It might be our next steps class. Or it might be one of our disciple Bible studies. But, but find a way. Find a way to rub elbows with other Christians and to study the Word together and pray for one another. Find a way to do that. Maybe you've been in worship, and, and worship is kind of the, the one point of contact you have with our, con our congregation. And, and praise be to God for that. But if you've been coming to worship for a while, find a way to get involved in a small group. And finally, make sure that you devote yourself to going out into the world in mission. Now, you don't got to go globetrot for this. You don't got to go the other side of the world for this, right? You can, um, but you don't have to. There, there, there are literally hundreds of opportunities for every single one of you, whatever situation you're in, every single one of you to be in service in this local community and in this congregation. Some of the obvious ones would be like Bread of Life, or uh, daily bread on Wednesdays, uh, or his helping hands over at Agape. But there's countless others, friends. We need ushers and greeters, people to greet people when they come to the door to be a smiling face. We need people to be at the coffee shop or at the bookstore. We need people to work with our children and with our youth. And we don't, we don't need you to do this just, just so that we can grow numbers or have a ministry that's vital or, or make sure we have the, the, gaps, the gaps filled. No, we want you to do this because you need this. It's part of the rhythm of gathering, growing, and going. So whichever one of those that maybe is deficient in your life, I encourage you to find a way to, to round out that tiller of transformation. If you're not regular in worship, be regular in worship. If you're regular in worship, get involved in a small group. If you're already involved in a small group, get involved in mission and service. Because it's this rhythm of gathering and growing and going that begins to change us. Our desire as your pastors is that, that you will commit yourself to this rhythm. Not because it's easy. And trust me, we're under no illusions that it is easy. It's going to be difficult. But we believe that this is the way that the Spirit of God will begin to transform us. Ask any farmer and they'll tell you that tilling is not an easy job. Tilling by its very nature is a disruptive act. 
Things get broken and ripped up whenever you till. It's not pleasant. It's not pleasant for the farmer, and it's not pleasant for the ground, to be honest. But it is necessary. If you want to be as fruitful as possible, it is necessary. But it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to pull out those bad things in your life, those, those rocks and those thorns, and that, that may not be too bad. I mean, those are the things we want to pull out anyway, right? Get rid of the bad stuff. That, that should be pretty easy for us. Those are the things we've been trying to get rid of for years. But any farmer also knows that when you till the ground, it's not just the bad stuff that gets ripped up, is it? No, some good stuff gets ripped up along the way. Both flowers and thorns get pulled up. The uncomfortable truth this morning is, church, there are some good things in your life that you need to get rid of, too. And those are the things that are going to be truly painful. It might be your family's involvement in sports. It might be you or your family's involvement in civic or community organizations. It might be just some hobbies and habits that your family has. And, and let me be clear, we don't need to get rid of these things because they're bad or evil, but we simply need to get rid of them because they are distracting us from who God is calling us to be and what God is calling us to do. The truth is that when we till the soil of our hearts, both flowers and thorns get ripped up. Both bad things and good things get uprooted. But here is the gospel promise, dear church, that when those things get uprooted, God uh, prepares a way for his word to get planted deeply into our hearts. And over time, as we gather and we grow and we go together, we begin to see the word of God take root. And God gives us a promise uh, through the prophet Isaiah. He tells us that when he sends out his word into the world and into our lives, it will always, church, it will always accomplish its mission. The word of God will never fail. It will never fail to transform us. It will never fail to challenge us. It will never fail to bring about the kingdom of God in our midst if only we will do the hard work of preparing our hearts to receive it. So let us hold fast with patient endurance to the work of God's word in our hearts so that it might bring about a hundredfold harvest of God's grace and mercy, not just for our sakes, but for the sake of all of those that we serve. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.